everyone. We are glad you decided to listen in on this conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in public school systems. My name is Darren Short, and I am a member owner of Columinate, a consulting cooperative in which we affectionately refer to ourselves as Catalysts for Common Good. I provide diversity, equity, inclusion, and intercultural competence and training and consulting. And today, I'm very excited to have a conversation with Amaha Selassie and Krista Aguirre. So Amaha uh, is also with Columinate, but Amaha, go ahead, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, great evening. My name is Amaha uh, Selassie. Uh, I do a lot of equity um, and diversity work inside of the community, uh, including um, I am executive director for after school program inside of uh, public housing because we want to make sure that uh, youth in areas that were, were lagging in reading and writing competency that they were uh, they had access to the resources and the opportunity to, to help them uh, move forward and you know we do work in schools and you know other things I did I just try to make the community uh, look more like a beloved community is what my goal is very good Krista. all right I think you do some other things too but uh, thank you for sharing that part of what you're doing with us so um, I, I'm aware that you are a man of many hats. <laughs> oh, yeah, good things. <laughs> <laughs> so, Krista, please tell us a little bit about yourself. So, my name is Krista Preston Aguero. I teach at Rice State University in the teacher education program. Um, and I've worked to build several minors and a lot of courses around equity and cultural humility for teacher mm -hmm. educators. We also get a lot of social workers, school counselors, and criminal justice folks in these courses. So, um, Amaha and I have been co-teaching um, almost since the moment we met. <laughs> Boy, yeah, a long time, like 2014 um, or something. Yeah, that's been... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and so we've, we've, we've done this work collaboratively. Um, we both have a pretty strong belief that the work is stronger when you have several minds um, mm. contributing together. So um, I feel like we've both been prepare, preparing for several decades for this moment um, mm -hmm. when schools are finally ready to think about anti-racism and talk about anti-racism um, formerly these were kind of you know um, maybe more controversial subjects but right now if you're not having a conversation around anti-racism um, in a school you are behind the curve and looking yeah. very quickly outdated and so i've never been in such high demand in my entire life yeah. i've had the summer i can ever remember um, and I'm, I'm doing all of it with joy because I'm so happy to see the ways folks are ready to do the work. Yes, definitely. Uh, in my part of the world where I live, there are school districts uh, pursuing this work, uh, and there are school districts I never, ever thought would mm. pursue understanding and equity and inclusion. So definitely uh, you'll be a little more ahead of the curve um, if you jump into this conversation right now you know that's a good point because because even locally you know there's a couple school districts i'm thinking of that you, that you that that you know you would have thought been more least likely to to have the conversations that that are having them now it, it's almost like an idea whose time has come you know and mm -hmm. uh it's it's, a, it's exciting uh to see and uh, i'm just honored to to be a part of that process yeah definitely well um in my work and your work um, I would imagine that we all use different lenses for helping clients approach diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And these different lenses for myself usually include intercultural competence, anti-racism, anti-bias, learner motivations, and a variety, other, a variety of other frameworks. But I'm very interested, Amaha and Krista, how you and your clients approach this type of work. So my first question is, how are the teams or the schools that you are working with primarily, even if it's not exclusively, but primarily approaching equity and inclusion work? I'll let Krista start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can start. Um, so uh, I think before, um, before the uprisings after the killing of George Floyd, um, people were not using the, the word race very easily. Um, 
And so a lot of folks were using the word equity. So for the last few years, these have been equity movements, movements toward equity. Um, and I would say Say one step behind, like one step before that was uh, the, they were using maybe words like anti-bias. There's been a lot of recent, um, a lot of recent criticism of anti-bias trainings because there's a lot of research that's come out that shows that learning about your biases doesn't really necessarily impact your actions at all. And so, if we're measuring actual outcomes, just knowing biases exist and learning about them um, don't move you very far. But there, you know, there's something. It's it's one step toward awareness, but sort of that, that anti-bias lens was a little narrower than folks have, have become sort of more recently. So folks expanded way out to equity and were scared to use the word race or anti-racism. But then um, I, I think during the recent movements, there's no one who's not using the word anti-racism or racial justice. There's no one who's not doing that now. So, um, I mean, I think, I think people are sort of, you know, flowing with the winds and realizing if they don't use certain words, they're outdated. Um, <laughs> right. So I, I think there's sort of motivation to use these these phrases. But when you change from an equity lens to a race lens, you really narrow the focus into sort of looking at outcomes by race and um, and having some of the conversations that a lot of folks weren't ready to have in the last few years that are sort of that appear more controversial and more difficult until you get into them. And then um, I noticed that once folks are in the room together talking about race, just about everyone agrees. There's very, once you look at the data, there's very little disagreement and everyone's sort of like, why was this controversial before? Um, so I, I think people were sort of scared to talk about it, but now I don't see anyone that I'm working with or reading about not using an anti-racism or a racial justice or racial equity lens. Yeah, okay. you know, I think it's interesting. You bring up a good point because to me, it's, it's juxtaposed or to to color blindness, right? So we were taught color blindness so long, and this notion of not talking about race, you know, and that you know that even race is something that uh, you know, wh while we know it's a social construct, that it was something of an individual instead of looking at structural, you know. And so now it's like this whole shift of, of looking that like like race is perpetuated and, and sustained not only by actions of individuals but by underlying assumptions that govern how we develop institutions systems structures uh and so it's, it's taking this 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 deeper lens right and so like right now so that that's part of the hesitancy before of using anti-racism is because that was this complete opposite of what the the ideal goal was was, was thought of as, as color blindness right and mm -hmm. and so but to me what i'm seeing in school systems is that uh, how do we create a place where everybody feels that they belong, right? Like how do we create this a sense of belonging within uh, the students? How do students see themselves, you know, uh, inside of the curriculum itself, right? And how important that is uh, in, in their sense of belonging, in their sense of possibility, achievement, uh, aspiration, right? All these things are, are tied together. So you see as people are starting to come around to it more and yeah, like equity, has been the word in, in, in our region for the last couple of years and a lot of great work with, you know, equity fellows and, and a lot of schools like, like looking at developing, you know, equity people inside their schools that are like, like targeted on like how to make their schools and their school districts, uh, you know, live into more of an equity space across, you know, gender, race, class, age, sexual orientation, um, religion, maybe. Um, but then also uh, just focus in on, on race. I think brings us to the conversation of, of difference itself, right? Is that like for a long time we've assumed difference means unequal, right? That like we have two things that are separate and so we make them one greater than the other or really like we use color blindness to minimize difference, right? And to say that we're all just human beings but when, when I see you, I don't see race. And so now we're getting to this point of, of knowing that like we can have difference and still have equality, right? Like, like to acknowledge difference, to, to share resources from different cultures, different backgrounds, uh, enriches the course and shows more of the human story and, and doesn't uh, reinforce this hierarchy that, that one group or, or, or group of people is superior or even human compared to everybody else. So you, you both mentioned something um, that are very similar, but there's just a little bit of a, a nuanced difference. Um, and so Selassie, um, <laughs> Amaha, sorry, Mr. Selassie. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned the idea of trying to make all the children feel welcome, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really a broader lens than maybe an anti-racism lens. But I think you, I hear you sort of suggesting that 
Um, both are necessary, but now is the time for the anti-racism ones. Yeah, I, I really think they're kind of one and the same, right? Because when, cause, okay. I think part of the thing is that like, like to me, you know, I'm a sociologist by trade, so, you know, I get a little nerdy sometimes, but, but uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's looking at some of the underlying assumptions. And for a lot of my white brothers and sisters, they were taught that they didn't have race, right? Like race was seen as something that other people had and not that everybody has and operates in, right? And so when we use anti-racism, uh, it's pointing out that everybody has a socially constructed or we've given these meanings to race and these underlying assumptions and these scripts or like ways that we interact with each other based upon our race or our gender or our class, you know, uh, and so to me, it, it really is all encompassing because we, we can't have a, a, a place of belonging until we unpack some of these uh, underlying barriers or assumptions, really, that, uh, that, that then dictates how we operate in the classroom. Because oftentimes what's been done in the past is that like, well, when we show all white images, white includes everybody. They're like, like when we say white, we're saying all human beings. Well, well no, I mean like, like that doesn't work that way, right? You know, and so mm -hmm. it's like, it's bringing in different voices, allowing kids to see themselves, you know, a whole notion of windows and mirrors, right? How, how I see myself shown inside the curriculum that I can aspire uh, to, to be uh, different things. So to me, the, the kind of the kind of one of the same, I don't think we can get to creating belonging without unpacking uh, not only race, but also how gender works in the classroom, how class works in the classroom, sexual orientation, especially in, in public schools where, you know, we have kids from all different types of backgrounds and perspectives coming. And so like, how are we including them and allowing them to see themselves, so different ability levels, right? I mean, all, all of these things uh, have to be included in the curriculum to really uh, be uh, okay. uh, belonging, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking here too, and um, I'll direct this at you, Krista. Um, so part of, there's, there's so many different layers of change that need to happen uh, when we are addressing equity and inclusion and uh, racism in our systems. Um, if you, in thinking about the lens of anti-racism versus the lens of anti-bias in our structures, um, would you just be able to reflect a little bit on what those difference, differences might look like? Yeah, so anti-racism is a much more, um, much more specific focus. And the reason why anti-racism is important is because we've never done it before mm. on a sort of, in, in a collectively conscious way around the country, we've never had a reconciling and said, we, we have, we need to improve, we can do better, we have some problems. There has not just been sort of like a wide acknowledgement about that. So. So that's why anti-racism is valuable right now and why it's being sort of captured in this moment because people are ready to sort of look at some things they haven't and, and admit some things and acknowledge some things and see some things they haven't before. So that's, that's sort of why this is important and why it's important to sort of focus because um, there's, there, there's sort of this idea of triage, like you, you take, <laughs> you've got to find the groups that are the most vulnerable groups. Um, and so when we're looking at our educational outcomes in this country, our most vulnerable groups are, are straight along the lines of race. And so there has been a system that is not, it, it is not that the people in the system is, are broken, it is that the system has been set up and has been constructed to get certain outcomes. And those outcomes have been extremely racist and we have never undone that. We are, our schools are more racially segregated than now than they were when we made laws to desegregate them. And for instance, you know, poor white schools get significantly more money than poor black and brown schools. And we just have some real messes that are directly traceable in our outcomes. And that's why the anti-racist lens is important right now. Um, but what you don't get when you, um, when you, just use the anti-racist lens is you're ignoring intersectionality. What about the, the black transgender student with a disability who's also living in poverty and has experienced trauma and is also a Muslim? You know what I'm saying? Like, so you have some, you have, you have so you're missing a lot of other parts of every single student's identity. And when you do triage, um, sometimes that means that, you know, you're saving one person's life, but someone else is gonna lose a limb, right? Um, just because one group is sort of having the most desperate educational outcomes, it does not necessarily mean that those other groups 
also negative educational outcomes are um, are not important. And so, when you just uh, when you have an when you have a an equity lens, sort of an educational equity lens, you can address all of those things. Right. The problem then with the equity lens, though, is that um, we often address everything but race. We've just done that historically. We we use equity as a way to um, basically put on a you know to just cover ourselves, to make it look as if we have, have done everything, but we usually just don't take on that huge project of anti-racist thought. And so equity sometimes is a code word for everything but anti-racism. Okay. So for both of you and your experiences uh, with working with schools, and I understand you have different levels of experiences, um, are they being open to and, and embracing this idea of anti-racism? Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, like like Chris out out of the country this 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 summer, or I would have been busy all summer. <laughs> I, I actually did some stuff remotely even <laughs> this summer, right. and then uh, when I came back, it's it's been it's been crazy, you know. And I know Chris all summer has been has been booked, you know, because like right now it's like things that weren't in demand before is now like we are like the 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 flavor of the month or something you know what i mean and hopefully it ain't just a month but right now everybody feels you know and not in just schools but just in general they feel that like they need anti-racism training and and uh a development right but uh inside the schools uh we're, we're seeing a lot you know like people are, are are pushing towards you know curriculum changes uh looking at you know staffing you know what i mean uh like like what like how to create pipelines so that uh, more minority more teachers are present because there's a direct link between you know uh, students seeing you know diverse teachers and 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 positive outcomes right and so yeah I'm definitely seeing a, a major shift in, in the structure of education really right now right yeah now. I'm seeing a lot of school districts make permanent moves that cannot be undone toward anti-racism. They are, wow. they're, they're making radical permanent moves. They're making, they're putting things, they're putting things as publicly and as officially as possible. Um, and I think part of that is public demand. Um, it's sort of like, if you're not going to do it now, I mean, <laughs> you know, th there's, a, there's a serious problem. I think part of it is that they're responding to public demand, but I also see genuine collective consciousness raising such that people um, school districts, people in positions of power in school districts are putting things permanently into place that will be there long after they're gone. Yeah, what, what's really interesting about that is, um, you know, I think um, probably many institutions, uh, especially public schools, have realized they need to do something, but they've always uh, probably been concerned because of the potential pushback. Yeah. And I think they know they're going to get pushback now but I think they're ready for it uh, because of uh, what you're suggesting, Krista, so. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I, I, I think, you know, some things have been known that need to be done, but the will wasn't necessarily there. But now that there's more public sentiment and public outcry, uh, it, you know, they can lean more into uh, some of the changes that, that they wanted to make but, but were fearful to, to make, even just a year ago, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just a whole different landscape, you know, like from, from mm -hmm. even last year, you know, especially this, this shift from equity to, to speaking directly upon race. All right, so I want to ask another question. Um, and, you know, it's clear to me um, that what you're experiencing with schools and what you're, you're moving towards is really um, um, challenging people to use that anti-racism lens. But I'd be interested in and just a little bit of a conversation about some of the um, strengths and challenges of the different approaches. Um, so sort of a, a 50,000 foot view of, um, you know, the critique 101, you know, what are some of the strengths and challenges of the different types of approaches to equity and inclusion and, and uh, meeting those with trauma where they are at? <clears throat> I'll kick it over. So I would say some of the <laughs> I would say some of the things that make the the movements the strongest that I've seen are when the leadership lead, and um, mm -hmm. when when, when uh, you know administrators are taking the lead in doing the work. That is when that is when the movements are the strongest. Um, that's when they have the best chance. Um, I think I think 
I think the weaknesses will play out um, and I can, I, I will just, I'll just ballpark predict what some of those weaknesses will be as folks start to implement these. Um, I've seen people, uh, I've seen people hire, um, you know, a, a person to sort of be over all the equity work and then um, not give that person any funding or any power or any support. Um, it's sort of like a glass cliff assignment. We expect you to fail because what we're giving you basically work that's nearly impossible and we're not giving you any support to do it. And we're sort of tying your hands behind your back. But every time somebody says, you know, there's a kind of a problem here. We point to you and say, but at least we got this person on the job. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're on top of it, right? And so yeah. that's, that's the way that it looks weak. It's sort of, um, and, and this has happened consistently. I mean, this is, this is the way that all of our anti-racism work in this country has gone um, over centuries. Every time we, you know, every, every like, you know, you, you free the slaves and then, and then you write a 13, you write into the 13th amendment that you know, slavery is still legal if people are convicted of a crime, and then you make it illegal to be unemployed, and then you, you, you know, you round up all the slaves who are unemployed, put them in prison, and put them right back in the fields, right? So we've always had this way of, sort of, um, sort of undercutting any any work that's been done, turning any around, progress. changing the rules slightly, and so I think I think the 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 potential weaknesses are if we fulfill all the categories that we put on our checklist, but we quit looking at outcomes. We just assume, well, if we fulfill all the, out the categories, the outcomes must automatically be there. We assume that it's sort of once and done and we don't go back and see, you know, what are the problems? Why is this not working? What do we need to adjust? Um, and I, I think about anti-racism increasingly as an exercise um, and sort of when we work out, we don't just sort of work out really hard once for one month and then we're done. We don't just say, you know, yeah, I was in shape that one time. And so we're done, right? <laughs> we, it's this continual exercise. And so um, it's, we don't know everything now about anti-racism. We, we have done very little an modern anti-racism work. And so as we do the work, we're going to discover some things we didn't expect. And so we're going to have to come back to that work mm. and keep reflecting and keep changing. And it's going to be an ongoing process of staying in shape in an anti-racist way. And so I think some I think some weaknesses will come when we just try to like put a bandaid over it, and then the wound festers and everybody says, "See, it didn't work, right?" Mm -hmm. And then you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think those are some ways. So it can be done well, but um, if it's done sort of, you know, if, if we have this one person who's part time going to do this work for the whole <laughs> for the whole district, and they're going to put about five hours a week into it, and don't worry, they've got it covered. That's just not going to be enough because this. This is a massive undertaking that our government, our own government has not successfully addressed yet. And so we're trying to address it on a small scale. It's not going to be this thing we write in a minute um, and we put into play and then it's just going to, it's all going to spin smoothly from here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you brought some real key insights, right? Especially this, this notion of like doing it in a vacuum. Um, when you have this one person who oftentimes, you know, has very limited resources or ability to change things and then, you know, expect things to go well. Um, so to me, like, I think, it, you know, having it be done in a learning community where, where people are, are learning more about this together and using their collective intelligence based upon, you know, what they're learning and their own experiences, right, of growing up and what they witnessed. Because once we get the lens, we can start unpacking our own, our own experiences in school and be like, oh, you know what? Now I understand this, this, you know what I mean? And like how to put that together to create, uh, you know, different experiences for, for youth uh, growing up. And, and I, I think like, to me, anti-racism isn't just like a, a technique, it's almost a paradigm shift, right? Because we have to look at some of the underlying mm -hmm. assumptions that created all of this, right? And so it's like, 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 like this, this notion of, of race being real. Like I've always wondered, like why if we know race is not, a biological thing why don't we teach that when they're young like why why is that something that you learn about i learned about it in college you know what i mean like and i didn't believe it for like man you told me race ain't real you know what i mean like <laughs> i've experienced race my whole life you know what i mean and so it's like uh so it's 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 so it's it, to me it's a paradigm shift and really looking at some online uh, assumptions within that you know uh it leads us to a culture of humility right so like when chris is talking about this notion that uh we're learning as we go Right, that, like, like, you know, practice, like, like, like Bill Hook, she said, trust but verify and practice, right? And so it's like, you know, we're trying things out and we're learning and we're growing. Uh, culture humility stands in because it's like, it's knowing that like, there's many things I don't know, right? So I'm gonna suspend judgment when I see a student doing something. I'm not gonna use my own cultural bias as a way of like interpreting 
why they're doing it without asking them questions or trying to understand from their cultural perspective why they're doing something that may be completely legit legitimate but it's just expressed in different ways because of their different cultural backgrounds right and so mm -hmm. it's really looking at like how to really uh develop a, a greater understanding of our students of uh the faculty everybody in the school and, and and developing that mutual understanding amongst each other right that we can move more towards this shared future from the divided past right and and i feel like as society is proclaiming more and more this notion that uh that you know race is just a social construct then our education system has to reflect what we want to see in society you know because you know we, we can't have two different systems happening at the same time and expect to get the the ultimate results which are people going into the workforce that that uh, understand difference can can operate in, in a global context right that that can uh build relationships across difference right all of these things are some of the skills that that you've uh developed but that they can take into their uh that are like core competencies when they go out into the world later on yeah go ahead i want, Krista. To, point out, I want to point out one more thing that i think is a, a potential weakness um that we have here and i i want to be careful about how i frame this because i don't like to call it a weakness i maybe i want to call it maybe a challenge yeah. or an opportunity yeah. for growth because I'm, I'm about to mention a group of people and we don't want to say that people cause us to be weak because we need everyone we can get on board right no matter where they're coming from and so i think another another um another challenge that emerges in this work is folks who have been led to believe that um anything that has to do with black people or you know anything that's pro-black or not anti-black um is anti them right so folks who are not black who perceive that or even folks who are black i've met a few folks i've talked to, talk to a few who perceive the for instance black lives matter slogan um to mean a lot of things that they cannot get on board with right um and so if your school um is making a lot of moves that sound like what people have been taught to believe is anti-whiteness for instance or anti-police or anti um government or anti-american right um if we continue to sort of if, if we if we identify really closely if the, these movements with other movements that people have already sort of set themselves against and decided there's nothing i can support there um then that can be a cha challenge as well and you see why i don't want to call it <laughs> a weakness because i i think it can be a strength because i what i found is that as soon as we really get into the work with anyone in the room. As soon as we start doing the work, even when we have, even when I have black folks in the room who don't think that systemic racism exists and do not support Black Lives Matter. Um, even when I get those folks in the room and we start telling stories of what's happened to children in our school systems, everybody's in agreement that we got to do something, mm. um, that we got to make some changes. And when we start to articulate those changes together from the places where we think we're coming from, where we think are drastically different, we realize that there's a lot of common ground that can be found. So yeah. I think I think another challenge that we have is that we've been taught to believe that race is political, and that if you belong to one political party or another, you um, you should follow their definitions of how you should view race, um, and this sort of that that you know caring about race caring about one race automatically means that you don't care about any of the other humans and that's another strength of the larger equity movement there are just more people that can recognize that as legitimate because there are some folks that um no matter what we say about race are going to say um now that's that's racist against white people right there's some folks that that really have been taught to see the world that way and when you listen to where they're coming from, you can get on board with a little bit of what they're saying and you can find some common ground, but sort of how that looks on the surface when we just come in with our big terms like anti-racist, right? And racial justice. We have to be careful about how that language might be alienating to some folks. Yeah. Um, I've heard some leaders say, you know what, if, um, if, if teachers hear what we're doing and say, I don't wanna be at this school anymore, good riddance, this isn't the school for you. And I don't know if that's going to be the best spirit. <laughs> I think we want to keep everyone we can because I think we can get a lot more people on board than we think we can, or that we've that we've been led to believe that we can by our political leaders. Yeah. You know, one challenge I see too is that um, I think a lot of people think about anti-racism work 
as only in the here and now mm. without recognizing the centuries of history of, of uh, racist policies and practices um, that, that do still exist today. Um, so I would, I guess I would identify that as another challenge. Um, and part of what I'm hearing too is, um, you know, it's got to be multi-stakeholder, multi-faceted, multi-organizational, multi-departmental, um, anyone and everything in a system or an organization has to be looked at and uh, through a different lens. So, Amaha. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And that's why, uh, you know, early on we, we found that like Chris and I, we, we, we teach this uh, class together for, for, for teachers, uh, of, you know, to be teachers. And, and what we found is that like having black and white together in the classroom, like, like we can model, you know what I mean, type, the type of conversations that, you know, that we need to have. We have our conversations. We don't always agree on everything, you know what I mean? So we, we even model how we disagree, you know? And, uh, but, but like uh, we, we have a, a sincerity about, you know, striving towards, you know, realizing our common humanity and, and how to, to know that it's a human story, right? And, and, and to really know that we're interdependent. You know, that like, like, you know, in African philosophy, it's Ubuntu, which means I exist because you exist and you exist because mm -hmm. I exist and I can't be all that I can be until you are all that you can be and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we're all in this together and that, you know, we're all at stake. And that, that's what kind of I was alluding to earlier when I was saying that like some don't see they have race. So since they say that they don't have race, they don't see like they have a part in this conversation. But no, we all are at a deficit when we don't realize our, our, our full potential and, and strength that we have by by like allowing race be a barrier from cooperation and collaboration and coordinated effort, right? And so it's like, how, how do we put all hands on deck to, to truly live out the potential that we have, you know, individually and, and collectively towards, you know, I always keep going back to a shared future from the divided past, right? And so understanding our history, having the honest, deep conversations that, that are necessary to, to heal the wounds and to, to move us forward where, you know, we acknowledge the dignity and worth of, of every human being, you know, and it's inside our curriculum, uh, it's inside our policies, our structures, our practices. Um, and it's not said, I mean, saying is part of it, but you know, like I, I, I want to get to the point where it just proclaims it, you know what I mean? That we don't have to keep saying it, but that like, like the things that we institute, like literally proclaim it without us having to say, okay, this is dignity and you know, like, like <laughs> I want to get to that point, you know, but you know, it's step by step. All right, so um, I wanna move on to the last question. And this might be the question that um, everybody is listening in on because of, um, and that is the question of, and I'll, let's start with you, Amaha. What are specifically are the teams or the schools you are working with doing to address uh, equity and inclusion and oppression in school systems? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, in our region, we have, I think we have a good advantage as far as that, like we've been having, uh, these opportunity maps were created years ago. That Opportunity what? Opportunity maps. And so oh, okay. they show how opportunity is divided uh, primarily by race and in our area. Uh, and so those maps are being used in a lot of different ways and, and including education. So I'm saying that to preface that like, Within Dayton, we, we've had, uh, or I would say Montgomery County, within our region, we've had uh, equity fellows and equity work happening for a couple of years now inside of different schools where teams are developing equity teams and, and they're learning about equity, this, that, and other. And now it's getting more into uh, anti-racism work, how schools are, are, are seeing where they are at. And then they're, they're saying like, what kind of trainings they wanna have, you know what I mean? They're developing uh, teams inside the schools uh, to, to have the conversations inside of there and inside the, the larger school districts of, you know, how to, to address it. And, you know, they're looking at curriculum, that are looking at, you know, the hiring of, of teachers. Uh, they're talking about creating a, a local pipeline, kind of like a grow our own type of thing where, you know, like we're, we're intentionally, uh, uh, you know, uh, recruiting and placing some benefit uh, to, to have teachers of, of different identities represented inside the school in the future. Um, okay. Pass it over to Krista. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Krista. <clears throat> I got a long list. I don't even know where to start with this. <laughs> I kind of I kind of know where to start, but I've I've got a list. All um, right. <laughs> as as I've met with different schools around the area. Um, 
I, I sometimes get called in uh, and I'll tell you sort of how the work usually begins. Um, I usually get called in after racism blew up in a school district's face. Mm -hmm. After, uh, you know, a school board member and a coach and a teacher all got written up in the local newspaper for some tweets. Um, and then the school board meeting goes three and a half hours while they listen to testimonies for the first time in a public way. Wow. What has gone on in their spaces. That is what usually um, provides the impetus for the change. And so, um, so in the school districts where the change hasn't happened yet, um, one way that a lot of uh, local parents call me, so I get called by the school, the school leaders or the local parents, right? I get, I get sort of these different calls from different groups who are trying to push change. I get calls from the local parents who say, where do we start? And so those parents are beginning by just collecting stories because once you lay the stories at the feet of teachers and administrators, oh. they know what they have to do. And so I think we have to trust them to be the professionals that they are. Um, so I think when we collect the stories, and lay them at the feet, that is when those stories can be used as case studies. How could we have done better? What can we do next time? But, um, but just as with the national riots, um, the thing that causes riots is when an injustice has been done, but authority figures have not recognized that as an injustice and that injustice has not been punished. And so when, the, when, when folks are like publicly called out for, for you know, years of, of very racist actions and words and intentions towards students um, and the school district does not do anything, that's when, that's when you have a real problem. And so um, I just see school districts sort of have these investigations that last six months and people just grow increasingly impatient and discontented. Why do you need to investigate one tweet for six months? Why are we still waiting on this, right? So, so that's, that's sort of what usually is the, the straw that breaks all, right, it's, it's just the thing, the thing that sort of lets the flood out. So, um, I want to I want to say that a lot of um, a lot of school districts that are being really proactive about this, they are declaring racism as a public health crisis. A lot of states are doing this as well. It's a sort of it's sort of an official move that begins to um, begins to sort of shift the way that resources are devoted to something. So, if we say a public health crisis is happening because of racism. Now we can use resources to address it. So that's usually a first move. City of Akron did that first, um, and they wrote a racial justice resolution. And then City of Dayton did it just about two weeks ago. Um, and so, so these are these are the the documents. And I didn't know about them until after I'd already written my list with superintendents. But what I know, I've been researching for a long time about things that actually have anti-racist outcomes. What I know is that those two documents they looked at what the research says. They're getting it. There's almost nothing that they've left out. And so those are really good. And I actually Dayton used Akron's document as a, as a, like a, as a model for them. So if you look at those documents, you see they're listing almost all the things that need to be done. And you're right, there need to be many stakeholders involved. There needs to be, you have to address curriculum. You have to, you know, bring in teachers of color and teachers who are LGBTQ and teachers with disabilities. Like these are all important intersections as well. Um, you have to not just bring in those teachers, but create a climate where they want to stay. So you have to retain them as well. You have to take school and city climate surveys so you actually know how folks of color are feeling and what their sense of belonging level is like. Um, there has got to be ongoing professional development for teachers. Um, a lot of school districts are using a sort of parent and administrator advisory board. Um, and whoever wants to be on that gets to be on it so that it's not controlled by a few parents who know how to get positions of power, right? So that takes a long time to do all that listening. Um, there has got to be a bias incident reporting system where folks can see that there are outcomes and actions or otherwise, you know, again, rioting is, is the language of the unheard, right? the folks who report something and see that justice is not done or perceive that justice is not done or something's not being handled, that's when it bubbles up. Um, the, all these school districts are also looking at implementing rest, um, restorative justice practices mm -hmm. instead of zero tolerance discipline in their schools. Mm -hmm. um, and they're seeking to diversify not just their teachers, but also their administrators and, um, and board members. And all of them are hiring at least one full-time person to take on the work and giving them a lot of resources to be able to carry it. 
And so they're shooting at sort of like this not ever ending at it being long term work. So that's just yeah. a, that's just sort of like an overview of a lot of the things that you'll see on these lists. A lot of the things that research says have a good a good chance at changing outcomes. Very good. Well, um, it sounds like a lot of school districts and, and towns and cities are starting to do the right thing and do do it in a multi-level approach uh, just because there's so much on so many different levels that needs to happen mm -hmm. all right well um would either of you have anything you want to say in closing this has been a great conversation um and you know we've addressed the questions that um, i've wanted to address um and i hope we can have more conversations but anything you'd like to say in closing you can go uh just uh th thanks for thanks for you know inviting us to to have this dialogue and, and i think it's a, a rich and important dialogue uh that people are having across the country right now and 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 i think it's going to take all of our collective understanding experiences uh, knowing what worked and what didn't work um to, to really uh unpack it and i really appreciate uh part of chris's last statement about um you know part of my research is really about how to center uh, the margins, how to bring the margins to the center of public policy, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, like capturing the youth experiences of, of what they actually, like, I was first called nigger in second grade, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, it, it's like, uh, like hearing the, the experiences and hearing, uh, you know, the youth perspective and not assuming that we know and we understand, right? But, like, allowing their voice to speak for themselves and to really be student-centered, I, I think, is crucial. Like, but we can't have student-centered without having student voices at the center, right? So okay. uh, I, I think that's a critical point of, of, of brings all together across, like you said, intersectionality, you know, from LGBTQ, from uh, different abilities, uh, gender, right, to really, uh, to, to really empower our youth. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't like the word empower, but like, uh, I can't think of a better one right now. So, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, you. very good. And I'm glad you mentioned that, bringing the, the, the youth in, right? That's not something that's been mentioned yet, but uh, that is a critical component of making change. Mm -hmm. All right, Krista, anything you'd want to say? It is, it, it, that's the thing. It is the youth stories that, that move change, that if you're not listening to where they're, where they're coming from, the change can't happen. And I, yeah. I hear a lot of people say, we're going to invite these folks to the table, you know, to have a, to ha to have a voice at our table, right? Mm -hmm. I hear that language a lot. Yeah. And I think what's really important here is to to let go of control of the table. Yeah. I think I think that the when I, I, I see this work really take a nosedive when we say, um, I can work with that person and that person, but that one right there, I cannot do any work with. I, I just cannot be around them. I cannot hear anything they have to say because our perspectives are too different. I, I feel like they're here just to stop the work, right? I say you have to you have to really invite diverse voices to the table and really take them all into account or the work is weakened. Right. Yeah. The table has got to be collectively owned. It cannot be a table that the folks in position of power set and then invite a few tokens to, right? right. It's got to be a table that we collectively own. And um, and so we, we, in a way, have got to let go of this work and let it, you know, I, I think we can be consultants and keep nudging folks toward asking about outcomes and making sure that we're actually checking in. City of Dayton um, wrote into their racial justice resolution that there will be a check-in every six months, right? So um, there, like a, a report written every six months to see how the work wow. is doing. So there's a constant check-in. But I think those of us who are accustomed to sort of driving this work have got to let it be community-driven as well. And I think we also have to let the schools do the work, trust the professionals to be professional, and push them when they are missing that you know, missing that target and push yeah. them to the results. Yeah. If I could add one thing, I, I would be remiss if I didn't, is mm -hmm. I, I think what Chris had just described is a process of how we build trust, right? So underlying all this work is the, the uh, building trust within uh, the school, mm -hmm. the school system, between the community and the school, right? Because movements move at the speed of trust and trust is what enables the cooperation, mm -hmm. the collaboration and the coordinated effort. So oftentimes the relationship building piece is often missed is missed in these type of transformational processes, but I think to me, it's like building these deep relationships are, are critical uh, mm -hmm. toward toward sustaining 
uh, meaningful change. And, and that includes bringing voices that, that, that often are, are, are opposed to each other to the table, to find those places where they can exploit all areas of agreement, right? So it's a slower process, but it's a truer process, right? That like, as each brick is laid, it's, it's laid, it's done, instead of like having opposition later on, right? So, so I, re I really wanna highlight what, what Krista just said. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. Um, it's great to hear this coming at me on this side of the screen. Um, it's been a very, very valuable conversation, very powerful. And uh, thank you both for your time. And um, I hope we can do this sometime again soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, look forward to it. <laughs> good. Thanks for bringing it together. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good one. Thank you. All right. Peace.